Again, guys, uh, it really is my honor and uh, to, to present our speaker today. She is amazing, and she is the first speaker of this of the series that we're putting on through May. And and uh, you know, I hope that this doesn't put too much pressure on Tina. But no, uh, let me <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about uh, about Tina. Uh, I should call her Dr. Kokosis. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but uh, I know her as Dr. Tina. Dr. Tina is. Uh, a periodontist has been a periodontist, practicing periodontist for over 14 years. She graduated uh, from the University of Western and then did her perio at uh, the prestigious Columbia University in New York. And she had a few options. We were just talking about that. Um, she is one of the most passionate speakers I have ever had the honor of, of seeing. Now, I've been, I had the honor of seeing her live, which is, is a rarity in, in these times, but I've seen her live. I've watched her do webinars. And the message, it doesn't matter the medium, the message is still there and you feel the passion from Tina. She is, she's taught at University of Toronto, but this is a woman who loves truly what she does. She is doing this for the right reasons. She is not doing this for any other reason than she loves what she does and she wants to help people. She wants to help her patients and she wants to help us as dentists and make us all better. And, and really, I don't think there's there's much nobler of a, of a cause when, when we're talking about what we're doing. We all, we all need help at times, and, and I'm telling you, Tina is there and would do anything for her colleagues and friends. So uh, stay tuned, she's, she's a pleasure to watch and, and listen to, and uh, enjoy the talk, it's gonna be great. Wow, that's an incredible introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumner. Jeff, you know, I, I consider you guys all a dentistry um, uh, academy, honestly, my true family. And um, I'm so humbled to be here and to be able to launch off this incredible series. So thank you so, so very much for that uh, introduction. I'm incredibly humbled by that. Um, so I just want to tell everybody, and by the way, Jeff, there's an e-transfer payment coming through for such a great <laughs> introduction. <laughs> I would take it personally, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, thank you so much, guys. It's an honor to be here. And, um, you know, uh, congratulations, everybody who have just recently graduated. And for those who are in dentistry, I think you've chosen a, an incredible career path. And for those of you who are in different stages of your career, um, I applaud you for choosing dentistry. And um, I think the best is yet to come. And the reason I say that truthfully is because as dentists, we're problem solvers. You know, we find solutions. And I really think that we're going to overcome this. And I think we're going to actually fly and really succeed. So, you know, um, you know, I just uh, applaud everybody for being here. And, you know, I say this all the time, give me a platform. I can speak forever. I know, unfortunately, I can't stay on this platform forever. So I'm going to go ahead and get going um, just to... Um, mention here as well you know what I'm just noticing that I'm not sure if this is there we go so let me just pass there we go I just want to make sure the slides are working so we already know um, about me thank you to Jeff who was so kind to introduce me um, yeah so I, I started practicing about 14 years ago um, I started off at Western then went to Columbia University um, and received my diplomat at the ICOI. Um, I think learning is key. And the beautiful thing is that our ability to learn and, and continue on our evolution of dentistry in our career really is literally at our fingertips, right? Um, so, um, you know, I continued on with my learning by becoming a diplomat. Um, I practice right now um, in Toronto and London area, and um, I do love lecturing, you know, um, I'm finding it's really an incredible passion of mine. I just also want to mention that I have no affiliation or financial affiliation with any material or companies that I, I, I mention here. Um, this is a perfect illustration of my personal chronological educational growth. Um, you know, as I said, you know, I find it's really crucial to always find mentors and I hope that we can be your mentors um, through your growth. Um, I think that continuing CE um, in, in our careers is important. Um, as you can see, some books have been so overused that literally like the font and the typing and the uh, print is actually going. Um, but Non-dental speaking, I actually, one of my favorite books 
uh, non-dental books really is Malcolm Gladwell's The Outliers. And um, I read this book um, close to about five, six years ago. And um, there was a key point that Malcolm Gladwell uh, raised in The Outliers, and it was talking about the 10,000 hour rule. And essentially it says to be a key leader in your industry, you really need to continue and focus and practice a key task for about 10,000 hours, which ends up being about 200 hours for 10 years. And um, this really resonated with me because when I first started um, practicing as a periodontist, although I was really proud of what I was producing, I always knew and hoped that I could even get better. And I struggled along the way with a few things here and there, as we all do, you know, and we really want to perfect our game. And the outliers and that 10,000 hour rule made me feel more comfortable with the fact that, you know, we need to learn how to crawl and walk before we take off. And, you know, and I just really um, feel that uh, as I was preparing this presentation, the key question that constantly came to my mind in terms of how to present this material really was, what do I know now, but wish I had known sooner? Like, what do I know now after practicing for well over a decade? Okay, and but what do I wish that I had known sooner? And that tells me and that helped me present this and, and prepare this presentation because the other question is how can I help you now accelerate your learning okay so this is the thing when we start um, uh, practicing dentistry and learning concepts this is what happens we have a whirlwind of ideas in our head we have opinions ideas definitions techniques procedures and they're all kind of like swirling around in our head and I think the most important thing for us, especially early on in our learning curve, and I want to help you um, to actually, you know, um, benefit and, and be part of this learning curve, is we need to actually take all those concepts that are whirling around in our head and deconstruct them and actually create what I call a core knowledge workflow. Okay, so we can actually, instead of all these concepts swirling in our head all at once, actually break them down into core concepts. Because if anybody's ever heard me speak, and I think that we all feel the same way, is you need to understand the key core concepts to be able to build into more advanced procedures. And I'm telling you, once you understand those core um, concepts and practice those key principles, you can fly. I mean, you can do anything you want. And so here are my six, I guess, key core principles that I want to help you and um, introduce to you guys. So first and foremost, what I'd like us to do is break down that whirlwind of information in our head into, key, into six key concepts. One is I want us to look at soft tissue biotype. Okay, the second one is let's discuss the three main flap designs and you can build from those. These are introductory, but all advanced flap designs originate from three, these three main flap designs. We want to talk about the difference between working and raising a flap in, and suturing in the anterior versus posterior regions. Um, I love apples. Um, the second one is uh, keratinized tissue. Let's talk about building good soft tissue. The next one, my favorite, I love discussing this. I love um, explaining it. I love teaching this, periosteal releasing incisions. And then we need to tie it all together and with proper suturing. Okay, so let's break this down. First and foremost, let's talk about soft tissue biotype. So one thing that I uh, feel we really need to understand is we really need to look at the individual um, soft tissue profile on our patients. I really do recommend that we take photographs of our patients and before we even take a scalpel to a patient's mouth before surgery, I really think we should study not only the, um, the patient's models but also the photographs because there are two main types of soft tissue profiles in the patient. One is called thin and scalloped. 
The other one is called thick and flat. And so the thin and scalloped tissue, okay, um, ends up having, sorry guys, um, the thin and scalloped uh, tissue presents itself with a thin, broad, thin band of keratinized tissue, okay, long papilla, triangular shaped teeth, okay, and also there's an association of thin tissue and thin bone. So when you, and if you take a look at this area here, look at that, like the prominences of these roots. It's almost like see-through. You, you can almost see right through them. And the way we determine the thin tissue is by just inserting a probe inside the sulcus of a tooth here. And by inserting that probe inside the sulcus, if you see that transparency of that metal probe through the soft tissue, then that's usually thin tissue. Um, thin tissue, uh, by definition, is tissue that's about one and a half millimeters in thickness or less, but that's very hard for us to measure clinically. So the best way to follow that would be actually with this, um, with this probe. Thick tissue presents very differently. This thick tissue here has a broad band of keratinized tissue. Okay, you have flatter papilla. The nice thing is you also have square teeth. And if you insert the probe within the sulcus, you don't see through it. Now I have a metal probe here and I have an implant probe here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which probe, um, whether it's, you know, whether it's a plastic probe or whether it's an implant probe. If you can see the transparency through the soft tissue, um, it's going to be thin tissue. And by definition, thick tissue is tissue that's two millimeters thick or more but again that's very hard to determine clinically and so for that reason we use this probe. I also want to uh, bring to your attention the contact point on the thinner tissue and the long triangular shaped teeth the contact point is more incisal whereas with the, with the um, flatter uh, tissue biotype generally we have the square teeth with the longer contact point. And this is also associated with thicker bone. So why am I bringing this up? The reason I want to raise this to your attention is because there are clinical implications to raising a flap in these different types of tissue biotypes. Thinner tissue here, okay, is going to be associated with uh, more trauma, greater risk of recession, and also more experienced elevation. We can't just take our standard elevator, like a molt, and actually elevate this tissue. You're gonna turn it into mincemeat. We're gonna, we're gonna shred that tissue, we're gonna tear that tissue. We also need to know and decide whether we wanna raise the papilla or not, and we're gonna talk about that. So this is why um, you know, it's so crucial that we really look at that soft tissue before we commit to the, inc to the incisions and to raising a flap. And speaking of flap, let's go ahead and talk about the three main flap designs. So there are three main flap designs um, I find in, in our surgeries. And as I said, um, any, um, the beautiful thing with developing these core concepts of these um, flap designs is you can build upon them and create more um, experienced flaps um, and more advanced flaps as, as your experience grows. Uh, but the three main types of, on, of flaps are the envelope flap, which is raising, um, uh, creating sulcular incisions around the natural dentition. Um, creating a crustal incision in the edentulous site and continuing on with sulcular incisions. The next flap design is our envelope flap, but we're actually creating vertical releasing incisions and including the papilla. And the third option here is a uh, vertical releasing incisions. And in this case, we decide to not include the papilla. We leave the papilla attached to the natural dentition. So for me, I find that I have three main objectives in flap design. The first objective is aesthetics. Nowadays, patients want um, perfection. Patients want to not have black triangles, okay? Patients want to know that if the flap is elevated, their tissue and their smile line is gonna look the same. So one is create a flap that will also maintain the soft tissue profile of the patient. 
And the next one is to actually create a surgical working area. I mean, the reality is, is we're raising a flap with intention. So we're raising a flap because we need to expose the underlying surface to, to perform our surgery. We need that wide enough to be able to have visible access and actually create our, our work. And the third rationale for flap design is for proper wound healing, okay? Wound healing is essential because what we need to do with wound healing is raise a flap and be able to bring it back and reapproximate these wound edges. Reapproximate them and also create primary closure. But it's not just creating primary closure at the time of the incision and the time of the suturing. It's also maintaining that primary closure that's gonna be essential to reduce bacterial contamination, okay? And to actually um, create um, to, and to prevent any um, uh, wound um, complications as, as such as infection um, under, the, under the flap. Um, the one uh, point that I do want to mention too with flaps is oftentimes, um, you know, when creating an envelope flap, we sometimes make it a little too conservative. And, um, you know, we also want to create a flap that's also um, wide enough, whether it be here at the, at the uh, incisions or high up here uh, where the, it actually extends uh, mesially and distally so our, so our assistants can also retract properly. Um, so one thing that I also want to talk about here too um, and, and talk a bit further are vertical um, releasing incisions. Don't be afraid of them. Um, a lot, you know, I do, as Jeff mentioned, you know, I, I have done a lot of lecturing, including um, surgical mentorship. And I've been very honored to um, uh, be part of um, some implant residencies where I've actually had one-on-one -on -one time helping patients place an implant and raise flaps. And the first thing patients say to me, or the first thing the colleagues, I'm sorry, say to me is I don't want to raise a vertical flap. Don't be afraid of raising a vertical flap. I think the important thing with raising a vertical flap is we need to know how, when, and where. And so when raising a vertical flap, what we have to remember is one, there are some anatomical considerations, which I will get into. But also when you raise a, a vertical flap, I would recommend that you keep it on the buckle and not on the lingual and raising it where it is at the distal line angle, or if you wanted to raise a vertical flap here, it's at the mesial line angle. Essentially, it's at the line angle of the teeth. And you extend that vertical incision, okay, just a couple of millimeters beyond the mucogingival junction. You also want to make sure that you do it with clean incisions and you're not going back and forth, up and down to actually create that incision. It's with a clean, fresh, sharp blade. Um, so we can reapproximate that beautiful soft tissue and get proper wound closure here. Um, we also want to make the base wider. In doing so, what we do is we maintain that blood supply here to this pedicle. Um, when you make incisions, as we do here, the blood supply terminates. So we cut off the blood supply into what we call a pedicle flap here. And so the blood supply is only coming from the surrounding mucosa in this area. And in doing so, um, and in doing so, we want to create a base that's wide enough to actually prevent necrosis of this, uh, this area. So the question that I always have too in the fear is creating black triangles. And um, there are some really good rules to go by. Um, the Dennis Turnau, which is a perioprostodontist who used to be at NYU and now is at Columbia University, um, created a five millimeter rule. And essentially, um, I found that this really comes in handy when determining whether you wanna raise a flap that includes the papilla in a cosmetic area, or whether you want to keep the papilla and create what we call the papilla sparing incisions. So what this rule says is if you measure the distance from the crest of the bone to the contact point, and if it's five millimeters or less, you will get 100% fill. Now, the truth is it's not 100% fill all the time. So it's you'll almost get 
um, uh, full uh, papilla 100% of the time. And that's really important. So if we were to raise a flap here, and this distance is five millimeters, I have to say I'd probably go measure this and hope that it's four millimeters. You know that if you put the soft tissue back within some time, chances are you will get some, you will get regrowth of the papilla. But if you want to determine whether you want to include this papilla in the flap or if you want to do papilla sparing incisions instead, if you measure this point from the crest of the bone to the contact point and it's, you know, five millimeters, five and a half millimeters, six millimeters, seven millimeters, you may want to decide not to raise that, um, not to include that papilla within the flap. You might actually want to decide that you want to do vertical releasing incisions, not including the papilla. And I find that this was a game changer for me. I find that this will help me um, to maintain, as I said, one of my objectives, which is create and maintain the soft tissue profile of the patient. So to finish off here too, um, if the distance here is uh, six millimeters, you'll get papilla uh, presence about 56% of the time and seven millimeters you'll get it about 27% of the time. How about if you have a tooth missing? If you have a tooth missing, okay, what happens is the papilla is supported only by the gingival fibers, the supracrestal gingival fibers of this press of this tooth. You no longer have that papilla support in this edentulous site. And that is really key to know when you're placing an implant, being so that um, the, uh, when a tooth comes out, chances are you're going to lose a little bit of papilla anyways. Um, what you want to make sure is that if you want to include this papilla, you want to do so in knowing that the distance between the crest of the bone and the contact point is probably four millimeters or less. Um, because if you raise this flap, and you include this papilla in your flap, and this um, papilla is of a thin biotype, and it has, again, back to that first slide I showed you, with a long, 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 thin scallop, long papilla, contact point is right here at the incisal edge. If there's any semblance of a papilla here, and the distance between the crest and that contact point is five millimeters, six millimeters, and you raise that, chances are you're gonna lose that papilla and patients are gonna complain about that pepper that's stuck in between your teeth or people commenting that there's something stuck between your teeth. Now you can cheat a little bit by actually creating a really beautiful, uh, a really beautiful crown with a longer contact point. But I find my goal in designing a flap is to try to preserve as much soft tissue as I can. If I have to play around with crown preparations with my lab and my restorative dentist down the road, I'm happy to do that. But I want to eliminate as much, I guess, um, soft tissue shrinkage as I can. Let's take a look at anterior versus posterior regions. As I mentioned, you know, we want to go ahead and preserve aesthetics. And in, in not only do we want to look at soft tissue biotype, but it's also nice to look at the patient's smile line. Not only just their, not even just at rest, but you want to look at their dynamic smile. Tell a joke, have a good jokes, you know, um, in your pocket, you know, just kind of like something that you can kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, just make a patient laugh in the dental chair, you know, to get a reaction out of them, uh, just to see what their um, dynamic smile looks like. Um, this would be considered more of an advanced case. This is where, you know, we, although we want to do a good job for both patients here, we know that there's less, this is less forgiving, you know, so this is where you take all those concepts again. You know, are we looking at thick tissue versus thin tissue? Um, you know, do I feel comfortable elevating thin tissue? What's the papilla like? What's the contact point like? You know, do, am I worried about, you know, papilla shrinkage if I elevate that flap? Well, let's consider then, you know, papilla sparing incisions and, and um, not include the papilla with my incisions. Another thing, and I think this is really crucial too, and I find actually we don't talk about this enough. Another thing we need to talk about is the anatomical considerations of the anterior region, and more specifically, the actual concavities in the anterior region, more specifically the lateral incisor. And um, a lot of us nowadays, I'm just gonna deviate a little bit, 
a lot of times nowadays we want to do flapless procedures or we want to go ahead and place immediate implants. And I'm all for that. Uh, that is definitely part of um, what I do. But I also suggest you also get a CBCT when doing so. Oftentimes we overlook not only just the soft tissue profile, but the fact that there usually is a concavity. And studies show the most prominent concavity, the region of the most prominent concavity in the anterior region is actually the lateral incisor. So we have to take into consideration also the bony contour when raising a flap and designing our procedures. In the posterior region, my biggest concern is actually the uh, mental foramen, the mental nerve, and also the lingual nerve. So when raising a flap in the anterior region, and if you're planning on placing an implant in the, in the uh, premolars, uh, you want to design your, your flap so that you... Um, if you, so that if you do need to raise vertical incisions, you do so in the correct area, and I'm going to show you how. Um, on the lingual, you want to make sure that if you raise a um, uh, flap on the lingual, that you raise it just past the mucogingival junction, just past that, just to maintain that safety zone, especially in the beginning and the early stages of your career. Speaking of that lateral concavity, this is actually my patient. This patient was referred to me um, by an incredible dentist, really, really, really nice dentist who unfortunately got himself um, just into, uh, found himself with an implant that he had placed immediately um, that had recurring infection. And this is actually the lateral, this is the canine, this is the, the 2 one. And uh, this patient kept getting all these recurring infections. And so we got a CBCT. I'm very sorry, I don't have the CBCT here with me. But we got a CBCT and what we noticed is a complete blood, uh, uh, bone loss on the, uh, on the buckle here. But also if you look, the, there was a concavity here that kind of got overlooked and the implant position is a little too straight up and down. And so we had a couple of options. Option number one was to remove uh, the implant and start fresh uh, with some GBR, uh, wait a little bit of time and then put an implant in about six months later. The second option that we had was to actually try and salvage this implant. And it really was not my ideal option, but the patient really did not want to let it go. The patient really was willing to go through the time and the effort of trying to salvage this implant, knowing that if it didn't work, that we can go ahead and um, remove it and start from, from scratch. So it was uh, treatment planning took a course of multiple weeks of explaining things to the patient, making sure that they fully understood the pros and the cons to every treatment. And I raised a flap. And interestingly, um, when the previous dentist raised a flap, this was the original um, location of the flap. And it actually left just a little bit of a scar. And the patient said to me, please, can you please not create more, I guess, irregularity to my soft tissue? I really don't like the way it looks. So I actually went ahead and created the incision in the same area as the original. Now that was a little tricky. And that was a little, uh, you know, not something I would probably recommend when, um, designing flaps and placing implants for the first time. Um, because what, what did I say were one of the few key objectives to flap design? One is also creating a surgical area with visibility and also to be able to perform your procedure. In this case, it was bone grafting. And so I compensated by actually making this more of a broader base. And I always show this picture when I, when I um, lecture. I love it because if we make incisions that are too narrow it doesn't allow us to be able to put all those beautiful biomaterials underneath when i add bone graft material here you can't just put a bolus of bone graft here you also have to blend it you also do not want the margins of your flap to be sitting okay um where all that beautiful biomaterial is because you don't want any kind of bacteria seeping through your incisions and actually creating any bacterial contamination so this one was a little bit of tricky i had been practicing for quite a long time at this point actually not really maybe four years to be honest with you um but 
still, um, you know, and we tackled it. And um, proud to say, I see this patient now once every year. Um, this was probably placed, yeah, probably about 10 years ago, and it's still functioning just fine. Uh, we can talk about uh, peri-implantitis and how to treat that at a later session. Uh, but um, this is where all the concepts kind of come together. Uh, I also decided to do papilla sparing. I did not include the papilla in this area. I want to show you guys a video here and just kind of show you guys in real life how this comes together. Crestal incision, sulcular incisions, vertical releasing incision at the line angle. And slow, slow, slow sulcular incisions along the long axis of the tooth and then careful elevation. Okay, you guys can do this without a doubt. Let me show you two. And what we're also creating here is a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap elevation. What does that mean? I'm actually reflecting the mucosa, but because I want to place an implant in this area, um, I am actually elevating the periosteum off that bone. And that is going to become important in a few slides where I explain to you how to actually close this flap when you add bone graft material. Let's look at the lower incisor or the lower premolar area. So we have here a very thin ridge. Implant placement and bone grafting um, are, um, will, will be uh, the treatment plan here. But what did I do here? Raised a crestal incision here, okay, uh, created a crestal incision, sulcular incision. I know that I'm going to be working in the premolar area. Well, anatomically, what's in that premolar area? The mental nerve. Sometimes what we need to do is actually expose the mental nerve so we can visually see it to make sure we don't cause harm to it. So continuing on here, vertical incision, as you can see, it's just past that mucogingival junction, carefully elevating it. And we can do, you know, some hands-on training just to explain, um, you know, how to um, raise that mental nerve. And then we access the mental nerve. The key point to this whole, this whole video too is, um, this is just my feeling and, um, you know, especially when you're first starting, when you're raising a flap close to that mental nerve and you know you're gonna be doing a bone graft and you wanna create a vertical releasing incision, please guys, always do it mesial to the canine. Do not go anywhere closer to that mental nerve. That mental nerve has fibers that um, extend into the mucosa and you don't wanna cause any harm to the patient, any kind of long-term or short-term paresthesia. Uh, let's go to the next uh, important topic, which is keratinized tissue. So keratinized tissue is huge. We know that um, bone sets the tone, but tissue is the issue. Uh, that's the famous saying in our, in our industry. Um, what we know for sure is we need keratinized tissue around implants. Um, just, the way, um, just the way teeth can get recession, implants can also develop recession. And I know that most of you I believe, may not know how to perform a soft tissue graft. Work with a good colleague, a periodontist in your area who knows um, how to um, also um, uh, perform soft tissue grafting. But another key point is we can really set the foundation and actually create keratinized tissue from the onset. Oftentimes, what a lot of people don't realize is when a tooth is removed, not only can you lose bone um, on the buckle, but you can also lose keratinized tissue. And so what you'll find over time is, you know, if there's a soft tissue biotype that's thin already, you probably have a thin band of keratinized tissue anyways. But if you start, you know, if you have an edentulous site in this area, what'll happen over time is you'll actually start losing that mucosal tissue on the buckle. And oftentimes the only keratinized tissue that you have left is actually on the crest. So when designing your flap, this is a perfect opportunity to get things right 
from the get-go. And there are different places where you can actually create your incision. One could be right in the middle, and the other one could be a more of a palatal crestal incision right at the distal, I guess, line angles here of these teeth. And so by doing so, what happens is if you, if you make that incision in this area and elevate forward, you end up getting, and maybe even preventing the need for a soft tissue graft. Um, you end up getting that beautiful soft tissue profile on the buckle. Um, instead of actually making it uh, maybe a more of a conservative flap, or maybe you just go towards the middle, or actually go here towards the buckle and bring it forward. In my personal feeling, you need at least, at least conservatively, three millimeters of keratinized tissue on the buckle and at least three millimeters of keratinized tissue on the lingual. Um, elevating a flap is crucial. And here's the thing, in dental school, we all start off with a certain set of instruments. And most of the times we don't end up having some of these really finer soft tissue elevators. And I would highly uh, suggest that you invest in a few really good elevators. Most of the time our, our kits come with mold curettes, but I also really believe in having these uh, finer periosteal, um, a mold, yeah, but end up, sorry guys, um, end up having, um, finer periosteal elevators. Uh, one is called a Boozer and the other one is a P24G. And the beautiful thing with these is that you have very small beaver tail, okay, um, uh, flat ends, and then you have more tapered ends. And the beautiful thing with these tapered ends is you can actually peel off the papilla with these small, finer um, um, sides of the elevators and then do your fine, careful elevation with these, uh, with these other um, ends with, of the beaver tail. Imagine going back to that first slide. Imagine thinking about that thin scallop biotype and then taking this molt and actually elevating the soft tissue. You will tear that flap. You will tear it. And not only will you tear that flap, you will also not be able to reapproximate it and bring it back to its original position. You'll end up causing recession, plus bacterial contamination and uh, infection possibly because you can't close it. Uh, I would also recommend um, um, a plier, uh, an Addison tissue forcep. And I also would highly invest in a castor viejo. And the castor viejo, which we're gonna talk about during suturing, is also important in making sure that when we do engage and suture that fine tissue, we also have a nice fine instrument to be able to move gently and to move with more finesse to suture properly. Here is a perfect example of elevating thin tissue. So this is my case. This is a connective tissue graft that I had performed on a patient. And this is a perfect example of elevating um, and, and the need of good, fine periosteal elevators to actually elevate this tissue. If you take a look here, beautiful young lady, um, and as you can see, can you guys tell me, or just think, because I guess we can't really talk right now, um, but why don't you guys think about what kind of tissue this is? Okay, when we take a look at it, this is a thin, highly scalloped tissue profile, thin biotype. Not only that, if you look here, I can see, look at that thinness of that tissue. Look at that scalloping. I can see the bulbousness of those roots. Do you think there's any bone here? No. So we decided to do a connective tissue graft. Quite honestly, I wanted to do a connective tissue graft for all four incisors. Patient only wanted to have two done, which is fine. I, I still a, a very successful and beneficial procedure. And we have a freedom. So what did I have to do in order to actually dissect, reflect this tissue to be able to put my connective tissue in here? First and foremost, I'll tell you guys, fine, good lighting. And I actually stood behind the patient at 12 o'clock position, and I like to do all my surgery standing. Literally used my um, tissue forceps and held onto this papilla, and literally with a fine 15 or 15C blade, I can't remember which one I used, I literally started to actually incise 
this papilla from the inside literally millimeter by millimeter, millimeter by millimeter, creating, starting off with the papilla here, making sulcular incisions all the way to the distal of this tooth and literally going millimeter by millimeter. It takes time. Do not give yourself inadequate time to raise these flaps. Um, and um, this probably took me, mm, I don't even know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes to actually raise that flap. Um, after going ahead and using my sulcular, uh, um, creating my sulcular incisions and just millimeter by millimeter actually just reflecting that soft tissue off of the bone, I then used one of my periosteal elevators and gently started just to peel further down here where the tissue and the mucosa um, was actually, where, where the mucogingival junction was. Took some tissue from the palate, tucked it in underneath here, sutured the soft tissue to these teeth, put the flap over, and then I, cre I did um, a little uh, phrenectomy and also this creates um, some mobility to my flap so I can get full closure. And that is what it takes. Uh, and um, you know, you guys can get there. As I said, once you understand those core concepts, I'm telling you guys, you can fly and we can help you. We hope that we can be your mentors. What is the next one? Okay, my favorite, favorite, favorite topic, periosteal releasing incisions. So what is a periosteal releasing incision? I found in dental school, no one explained this to me correctly. Sorry, everybody at school. Um, but um, so what happens is when we perform a procedure, such as, for example, implants, um, we, and we end up wanting to do a bone graft underneath the flap. We now change the surface area underneath the flap. We're now adding volume underneath this flap. So do you honestly think that I can take that flap and close this and get primary closure? No. And the reason being is because, and I found this very confusing when I first started off um, um, early on in my career, is there's two different types of tissue, although it's not outlined this much on this deniform. There's thick keratinized tissue that's not mobile. And then there's thinner mucosal um, tissue. There's something here called a mucogingival junction. Let me see if I can remember how to do this. Let me see here. There we go. Okay, so there's thick keratinized tissue. There's a uh, thin, uh, uh, and then there's that beautiful mucosal tissue that's elastic. And there's a junction here called the mucogingival junction, which basically demarks the, 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 the change over from the mucosal tissue to the keratinized tissue. So this is where I was always a little confused very early on in my career. Well, if I have mucosal tissue that's elastic, why can't I stretch my flap over? Why can't I stretch that flap over and close? After all, isn't this tissue elastic? But when we're actually elevating our flap, and remember, we're raising a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap um, release and elevation of a flap. What that means is we're actually lifting the periosteum off the bone and, and incorporating it into our flap. Now, let me just show you guys this video. I'm not sure. Sorry, guys, I just have to go back. Hold on, let me just do this. There we go. All right, now we're going. So, as I mentioned here, because of the fact that when we raise a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap elevation, okay, the inside of this flap has the periosteum attached. When I try to actually close this with a bone graft, it just doesn't move. And you can't just rely on just tight sutures to get primary closure because this area will heal with inflammation and swelling, so much so that the flap will tear through the sutures and you'll end up actually getting an open wound. So, when you take a look closely here at this diagram, you have bone and a flap. Periosteum is actually a dense layer 
okay, of connective tissue that maintains the blood supply to the bone. The thing is, is this is not mobile. And so when you incorporate this in your flap, your flap becomes tethered, which means it's not mobile. So what we have to do in that case is actually create what we call periosteal releasing incisions. What that means is we create, using our scalpel, a fresh 15 blade. We take the inside of the flap, holding it carefully with tissue forceps, and we literally just what we call score the periosteum in, in a mesial distal direction, um, one millimeter in depth only, to actually release that periosteum. And in doing so, you can actually create, you can actually create movement of your flap. In doing so, what that will do is create and allow for that new bone falling that you've put underneath your flap. Let's see it live. Can you guys see that stretch? And so how do you know if you've done this enough? Let me just go back to this slide. How do you know if you've released it enough? The way you know you've released this enough is that this flap should be so mobile that when you test it, you can actually overlap it onto the lingual by about three to five millimeters. I'd actually say more five millimeters is closer. And then you go ahead and suture it. Do you guys see that? And I want you guys to know, so you don't get nervous when doing this for the first time, this takes time. This could take 10, 15 minutes to get it right. So please don't feel that after doing it once, you should have that mobility the way we do here. Okay, sometimes it'll take a little bit of time. The way you angle your blade is really at about a 60 to 90 degree. It's not 45 degrees. And you always use a fresh 15 blade. So you guys are gonna have these videos. What we're trying to prevent is what we call incision line opening. We do not want opening and bacterial contamination of our bone graft, especially if there are implants. What happens if you have incision line opening and you have a dehiscence, the flap opens during the healing, you'll end up having possibly integrated implants with bone loss. Okay, so um, to me, that's a complete failure. If you take a look here, what are these lines? What are these grooves? Those are actually sutures. The sutures were tied so tightly and because of the swelling and edema, the flap could not stay closed anymore and just opened. So the periosteal releasing incisions are key if you want to practice and actually perform um, bone grafting with, with dental implants. So I'm going to finish off by talking about suturing. So I get asked all the time, what is the best suture? And the reality is, it's, it depends. Just the way, you know, page, my colleagues will ask me, what are the best, what's the best flap design? Well, there's so many factors and variables to consider. So the reality is with sutures, the same thing. We need to understand the core concepts. And there are three I, um, key factors when determining the best suture. One is select the appropriate thread. The other one is select the, the appropriate needle. And the other one is the design to tie and that beautiful work in, in place and maintain proper wound closure during the duration of the wound healing. So I know this looks very daunting and you guys will have this slide as well. There are, you can break down um, your, um, um, your needle and suture selection into natural and synthetic, non-resorbable and resorbable, and also monofilament and braided. And um, when we first started, and it's funny because um, I know that when we're first starting off in dental school, we all learn how to use, how to suture with 3O or 4O uh, silk sutures and plain gut and chromic gut. And for a lot of us, those are the sutures that we will maintain throughout an, our entire duration. Um, but there are so many beautiful new generation um, sutures that are available today in the synthetic department here. And we have beautiful 
monofilament and braided sutures that are available. So the issue with silk sutures is initially, okay, you can have silk sutures here that are multifilament that look great, but over time, when you leave them inside, um, when you leave them um, in place for the, for the healing period, that can often be with implants or even an extraction socket for a period of two weeks. And you will get a lot of bacterial contamination of that braided suture. And that's when you get, you know, you see your patients two weeks later and they have like literally layers and layers and layers of soft plaque, you know, lining their, the suture and the suture knot. And also when you look at the soft tissue surrounding that um, suture, it's, it's inflamed. And the whole goal of this is just to have tissue heal atraumatically and with as little inflammation as possible. If you compare it here to a monofilament suture, with bacterial exposure, you get very little bacteria. Not only that, sutures elicit an inflammatory response. And so silk sutures at seven days will have a lot of inflammation. This is the suture and this is the inflammation. Okay, 10 days, even worse. And when you compare that to a monofilament suture, an EPTFE is a beautiful monofilament synthetic suture. Take a look at it. It really elicits less of an inflammatory response. Um, thread diameter is really important. And again, when we started off our career, we started off using, um, you know, larger sutures and uh, 3040. And I really want to expose you guys, if you're not exposed to already, smaller diameter sutures. I personally find that um, the 4.0 and the 5.0 are probably the ones that I use more frequently um, in my connective tissue grafts and also implant placement. But also, I truly do enjoy using 6.0. And if you enjoy working with a microscope, you can go to 7.0 and even finer. Um, I do not think 3.0 really is the best thread diameter for suturing. Um, the only disadvantage to them is that they do become a little weaker, but that's all in um, practice and manipulation and being able to work with it over time. We always want to have a reverse cutting um, needle and uh, the reverse cutting is really essential. It is a cutting needle, but also when you tie your suture, this is where the tension will be with the knot and you will not um, get tissue tearing. If it was not a reverse cutting and if it was conventional and if you flip that around, this is where the tension would be when you tie your knot and that would end up causing more um, uh, trauma to the soft tissue. And that's the reason we want reverse cutting. Um, the suture needle, um, very funny. Um, it, it happens all the time in every office where my assistants will order sutures oftentimes and I'll get a 5.0 diameter uh, uh, thread. And 5.0 is great for thinner tissue, such as that thinner biotype, but they'll end up with a massive needle, which ends up causing trauma to that soft tissue as you're, as you're creating your, your, you're passing the needle through your soft tissue. So I always say, back to the slide, um, tissue that is thin, like a thinner biotype, you want to always use at the biggest um, the biggest diameter you want to use is a 5.0 and for that thicker biotype you can get away with 4.0 um, and, but you have to also match those up with the needle and for my 5.0 diameter sutures I always match that up with a P3 and with the 4.0 I usually match it up with an FS2. Knots are also really important. Again, I so everyone designs their knots very differently. Um, I design my knot for conventional sutures, such as silk sutures, plain gun, chromic gut, if I use those, with that surgeon's knot, which is two throws forward, one throw in reverse, and one throw forward again. The whole goal of that two throw forward is to create tension in the knot to prevent knot slippage. And I'll just show you guys how that's done.
always have a knot away from the incision line. You do not want that knot that can create bacteria, accumulate bacteria on that incision. And when you trim this, um, when you trim it, you want to make sure that you have what we call a tail of about three millimeters. Okay. Now, talking about knots, um, these newer generation synthetic um, um, sutures um, have such unique properties nowadays that your manufacturer will have a not recommendation for the suture. So what I recommend is if you're using a silk suture or a plain gut or a chromic gut, I do find that 211 knotting is really, works very beautifully. But when you get into more um, of the newer synthetic versions, I really recommend that you look at your manufacturer's recommendations because they will probably have different knotting recommendations to optimize the knot security. And then here's an example of what you can conventionally use right now for different parts of your incision. So now it also depends on your biotype. It's, it comes back to that biotype. For thicker tissue, you know, you can use a 4-0 or a 5-0. Um, but for thinner tissue, you definitely don't want to go any bigger than um, a 5-0. For these vertical incisions, I'll tell you, over the years, what I have learned is I really like using um, resorbable sutures for my incisions, um, uh, my vertical incisions, because when you go back to see the patient for a post-op, this is the most tender area to actually remove sutures. Very, very uncomfortable for the patient. And I find these heal very well and very quickly, these vertical releasing incisions. And so I do go with a resorbable suture that has um, you know, a resorption time of seven to 10 days, chromic gut, ficral repeat, um, or a monocryl. Um, just so I really do not wanna go back there and actually take scissors to an already sensitive area and, and remove that suture. Now, I'm just gonna introduce you guys. There are so many sutures that I'd love to show you guys in another lecture or with some hands-on training. Um, I think the key ones that you really need to know are the simple interrupted. There is the continuous um, locking suture and a horizontal mattress. And as I said, guys, in 45 minutes, I, as I said, I could talk forever uh, about perio. Uh, I could talk forever about anything, quite honestly. But, um, you know, I just wanted to highlight just some key sutures that you guys may not have um, be familiar with. Also, when I lecture, these are the most commonly asked um, um, suture designs, and everybody wants me to demo them for them. So let's take a look. So back to this slide. So simple interrupted is try, tested, and true. It always works. Okay, you can't go wrong with a simple interrupted. I think the most important thing is there is something called a three millimeter rule, is you usually stay about three millimeters away from the incision line. For any suture that we provide, actually, three millimeters away from the incision line. And usually you wanna make it three millimeters away from the adjacent suture you know what, in a smaller area, I may go less than three millimeters. But it's really important that you keep everything equal, which means that the, uh, the buckle and the palatal incision or, or um, um, entry point should be symmetrical if you can, and they should also be equal distance to the adjacent sutures, okay? Um, all, a simple interrupted always works. A continuous locking suture is great for those times where I have a long span um, 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 flap that I need to suture again. And I usually use it when I don't add bone graft material. It's just a really clean entry and closure. When I do add bone graft material and I've done, per, you know, I've done a place an implant or maybe I haven't placed an implant, I've just done some guided bone regeneration and I want to, and I've performed my periosteal releasing incisions, 
I want to make sure that my flap does not open. And what I have found is my horizontal mattress is probably one of my go-to. A horizontal mattress suture is where it's literally just like a little square and I, and I have a video demonstrating it. But the beautiful thing is it's called an everting style suture because when it's tied together in the mouth intraorally, the connective tissue on the buckle, the soft tissue, I don't know if you guys can see me, but essentially the flap on the buckle and the flap on the lingual and the, connect, the inside the inside of the connective tissue on the buckle and the inside connective tissue on the lingual actually join. And it really um, uh, creates a beautiful connective tissue to connective tissue healing over a larger span uh, of area. And it really resists um, um, incision line opening a lot more. Uh, and then I pair those off. You could do multiple horizontal mattresses in a row. Um, I like to actually do these separately. And then in between, I like to place um, um, simple interrupted sutures. So let me just show this to you guys. Sorry. I usually put music to my video. Sorry about that. So you start this off um, th about three millimeters away from the incision line and you start it the way you would with a simple interrupted except this time you go back to a couple of millimeters away from that palatal um, um, uh, suture. You just carry that over. So you make an ins a second uh, uh, bite into your, into your um, palatal tissue, a few millimeters away from the initial one, and then just go over to the buckle. And it literally becomes a perfect square. Now, if these have been if, I've, um, if I perform periosteal releasing incisions, you'll actually see this lingual flap and this buckle flap actually flip a little, actually flip a little so that, as I said, you have connective tissue to connective tissue. So let's keep going. So you take what we call a bite into the soft tissue about three millimeters away from the incision line. Across to the uh, lingual flap using my tissue forceps to help lift the soft tissue as I'm, as I'm uh, suturing. And then I create my square knot, my surgeon's knot. And then what I will do oftentimes is I, you know, the horizontal mattress really are not enough to get that nice closure and adaptation of that incision. Um, so I often pair these with simple interrupted sutures. So you guys will have um, these. Um, you guys will have these videos. Um, let, I know that uh, we have an incredible lecture with Nahid Mohammed coming up as well, and I don't want to take up his time. But um, yeah, so we create that simple interrupted suture uh, here, and I'll just. Um, And then one more, okay? So 
I'm going to just carry on and just go to the next one because I'd like to demonstrate the continuous locking as well. Here's a picture of what the continuous locking is and let's go ahead and uh, demonstrate it. So you start this off with a continuous, uh, with a simple interrupted, that's what it starts to look like initially. And instead of cutting those tails, you just cut off that terminal one and you continue. And what you do is you don't slide that suture all the way through, you leave a little loop here. And what you do is that you then take your needle and loop it through sling it through that loop and you create that horizontal portion of your suture locking that in place So I'm going to just expedite this just a little bit, just to show you guys, because I think the key is the beginning, and you guys will have these videos. But also, the most important thing here, though, also is the end. How do you tie this off? Oh, sorry, okay, let me just go back to, there we go. I'll just kind of leave it at this. So when you tie this off, there we go. You leave that loop, as you can see there, and you actually just use that loop as that terminal part of your thread and do your knot that is appropriate for the suture that you use. And at the end, what you end up with is three tails instead of two. And that is really the essence of that continuous locking. And uh, practice makes perfect. I want you guys, uh, you can practice this on anything at home, truly, an orange, an apple, um, like, you know, dental forms that you were going to throw out from dental school, you know, don't throw them out, you know, make an incision and practice it. It's really, um, you know, it, it looks a little daunting in the beginning, but I promise you guys, it actually really is one of the easier sutures. And that's it. So what's next? Um, so um, what we're hoping um, to do within the next, um, at the end of the month, is actually talk about um, lecturing on the new periodontal classification. Um, and also to carry on further um, and to, um, and as an extension to today's suture, what we'd like to offer you is a hands-on mentorship on flap design and suturing, where we're actually gonna talk in greater detail how to elevate the flap and actually do it together so that we can get you guys more comfortable with incision designs and elevation, especially with the thinner tissue, how to manage complications, different suturing designs. So I want you guys to know that the future date hasn't been set yet, but that is coming. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, you know, you can catch me on LinkedIn. I literally decided to finally catch up with modern times and finally created an Instagram page. Uh, I don't have a lot of postings there yet, but you can um, DM me on Instagram and I will have some photos coming up. Um, I also created um, an academy uh, called Global Dental Academy and that's really in the works. And also last but not least, Dentistry Academy is the bomb. Like Dentistry Academy is 
we would not be here if it wasn't for Dentistry Academy. And so I feel so honored to be part of this. Um, and the website for Dentistry Academy is dtacademy.ca. And uh, guys, I hope I got this right, info at dtacademy.ca. Um, I want to thank you guys for your time uh, and spending a portion of your morning with me. I also just want to give a special shout out to the surgical room who provided the sutures uh, for me. Thanks, guys.